All right, it is 12 o'clock, and I think we've got a quorum here. Uh, thanks, everyone, for showing up today, in, even though there's the inclement weather. Uh, welcome to Medical Grand Rounds at the University of Colorado. Really happy that we are back in person again this year, so encouraging everybody to come to the Proven Conference room in RC2, uh, although we will broadcast via Zoom, of course. Upcoming talks, just as a little bit of a teaser, on January 18th, we're welcoming Dr. Janine Young to speak about case studies in immigrant and refugee health. And then on January 25th, we'll hear from Dr. Anna Jovanovich regarding updates in nephrology. Uh, as a reminder, you can hit that QR code for CME and MOC credit for all our grand rounds this year. Questions will come both from the live audience as well as on Zoom. Thank you to the chief medical residents for monitoring the Zoom. Now, I really am very pleased to welcome Dr. Matthew DeCamp uh, to grand rounds today. He is an MD. PhD. He's an associate professor in the Center for Bioethics and Humanities and also in the Division of General Internal Medicine here at the University of Colorado. He did his undergrad work at Purdue University, where he honored in biochemistry and graduated Phi Beta Kappa. His medical school was done at Duke, where he was in the MSTP program. He received uh, concurrently his PhD in philosophy uh, while he was at Duke during that process. He was a resident, uh, as Dr. Chopra and he were just talking about, at the University of Michigan. He also completed a fellowship in 2013, uh, the Greenwall Fellowship in Bioethics and Health Policy and General Internal Medicine at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. DeCamp is a practicing internist, a health services researcher, and a philosopher. He enjoys both empirical and conceptual methods to identify and solve cutting edge problems at the interface of healthcare policy and bioethics. With, a spe with special emphasis, his research includes engaging patients in healthcare organizational decision-making, ethical issues and artificial intelligence, and global health with a focus on short-term global health ethics. Uh, he is a highly awarded uh, physician as well as human. Uh, he started with early recognitions, uh, receiving the Goldwater, was a Goldwater Scholar in high school. He was a Rhodes finalist in college. He won the Jeremy Sugarman Award for his work in bioethics as a fellow at Hopkins. And in 2022, he was one of the Department of Medicine's Rising Star Award winners. He is a national expert and frequently invited to speak on ethical issues in healthcare, issues of access, issues of fundamental rights, ethical issues around global health and global medicine, as well as the ethics surrounding communication and social media in medicine. His work is currently supported by two RO1s, a U01, as well as several under other funding sources. Um, and along with his other research endeavors, Dr. DeCamp is a principal investigator with Donald Neese and Spiro Manson on a grant examining the social, ethical, and behavioral implications of COVID-19 testing across five Colorado communities, and is leading, along with Hillary Lum and Stacey Fisher, a supplement to the Palliative Care Research Cooperative examining the social, cultural, and ethical factors that promote COVID-19 vaccination among the understudied, underserved, and underrepresented populations in Colorado. That is uh, in addition to funding that he receives from the Fogarty International Center, where he is supported to do work on new training materials on decolonization of global health educational materials. And lastly, he is the principal investigator of a Greenwall Foundation making a difference grant examining the ethics and chatbots in healthcare. So wide ranging interests and a lot of accomplishments. Really pleased to welcome Dr. DeCamp to Grand Rounds. Well, thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And I actually also really appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk here at home. I feel like I started here four years ago, right before COVID, and it was harder to get to know people. And, and it's, so it's really great to present here in front of the Department of Medicine. I really appreciate the opportunity. I am a primary care physician. I have a background in philosophy. I do some empirical research in bioethics at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities. And I hope to show some of that today, show that intersectionality of different methods, conceptual methods, empirical methods, to help, uh, help you understand the kinds of work we do at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities. So I may talk fast with the hope that we have plenty of time for Q&A towards the end. And I am gonna to talk today about ethics, bias, and artificial intelligence in healthcare. These are just a few disclosures. Uh, the funding that the funding that's provided for the work I'll present today is from the NIH NINR, that's an R01, and also the Greenwall Foundation funds the chatbot study I'll tell you about. A couple other funders listed, no conflicts of interest to disclose. And just so it's clear, when I present products, it's not for endorsement, it's just for illustration. These are the objectives. By the end of today, I hope you'll be able to describe some of the historical and structural causes of bias in AI. Hope you'll be able to explain two causes of bias in implementing AI um, that could even affect what we call perfect algorithms. 
and then assess different strategies for mitigating bias for the use of AI in healthcare. And I'll start with a clinical case, two cases actually that I hope to explore throughout the rest of the talk. You're seeing a 76 year old female patient in clinic. She's a former smoker and has dementia and heart disease that impacts two activities of daily living. Her BMI is 26 and on your electronic health record, a pop-up appears and suggests based on an artificial intelligence algorithm that her median survival is five years and that palliative care consultation is recommended. In fact, it can be done via a pre-filled order set. Now you might have questions about this. Should you follow the recommendation? Could this AI-based recommendation be biased against this particular patient? Are you liable if you choose wrongly about following the recommendation or not? Here's a second case. A patient with depression and anxiety is following up in clinic. He mentions that he recently heard of a new digital agent, Wobot, looks like this, that is available for mental health treatment and support. He tells you he found online that the bot fosters human-like bonds in only three to five days. And that's really Wobot. And that's a real interchange between Wobot and a patient that was publicly disclosed at that website. Again, you might have questions. Should you recommend Wobot? Is the bot or its appearance somehow biased in a particular way? Is it FDA approved? So what I hope to do through this presentation is use some of our research as well as some conceptual issues in bioethics to help illuminate these two particular cases. I won't necessarily provide answers to the cases, but I will at least help us think through some of the ethical implications and the ethics issues that come up through real world cases like these. Let's start by talking a little bit about the AI landscape. I'm not gonna go into detail about machine learning, deep neural networks and so on, but I at least wanna give you a sense of what AI in healthcare currently looks like. Many of us are very familiar with AI like this one, Alexa, based on natural language processing. We may take it for granted. I asked Alexa earlier today, Alexa, when will the snow end? Alexa answered me with a correct prediction about when the snow would end here in Denver. So through natural language processing, Alexa knew where I was, knew the connotation of my question and answered it, answered it correctly. That's an example of natural language processing. Another seminal event in AI is the story of AlphaGo. A few years ago, there, the game Go is a very complex game, more complex than chess, with more complex branching algorithms. AlphaGo was trained to play this game against human players. Now, not only did AlphaGo, you know the story, AlphaGo is going to win against some of the masters in the game of Go. But really importantly, through some of the games, AlphaGo used strategies that had never before been used by a human. So in other words, AlphaGo didn't just master the game, AlphaGo innovated in the game, and AlphaGo therefore changed the game forever by virtue of being artificial intelligence. So all of us, I think, are familiar with stories like these in AI, but of course, AI is in healthcare too. This is a slide, it's very complicated, but what it shows you are a number of FDA approvals for AI over the past several years. If you were to look closely, you would see that we have plenty of approvals in the area of radiology, but also cardiology, endocrine, ophthalmology, and so on. So AI is starting to impact healthcare as well. Let's dig a little deeper. As I mentioned, AI is often used in radiology because AI is pretty good at picking up image patterns and being able to help interpret images. We have derm assist, where you can take a picture of a derm lesion send it to the AI, the AI provides a prediction about the diagnosis, that's called derm assist. Diabetic retinopathy, another popular off-sited example of how AI can be used to interpret retinal images to, to diagnose diabetic retinopathy. Lots of potential for this in global health. Leapfrogging technical barriers to allow us to provide access to care we otherwise might not be able to. It's not just imaging, this is an example of using AI to predict Parkinson's disease from breathing patterns. There are others that use click patterns and motion patterns on mobile phones to diagnose things like Parkinson's disease or other neurological disorders. So diagnosis, a clear area where AI is coming, but also in treatment. Here's an example where AI has helped guide treatment around radiation for head and neck cancers, or even predict the best depression medication for you. So AI impacting treatment, 
And then, of course, one of the issues I'll talk a lot about in one of our studies, the R01 study, use in prognosis, prognostication, the provocative headline, this AI knows when you'll die and its creators don't know how. So AI being used in prognosis to help us predict time of death in certain patients. You may wonder, is this just hope or hype or what is it? There have been many boom and bust cycles of AI over the years, at least three, maybe four. In the 1970s, there was a program called Mycin that helped predict antibiotic selection for clinicians and early use of AI in clinical care. New computing power today, the availability of data, which is now incredible, have led many to believe that this is the dawn of a new age, that now we're finally with computing power and data, going to be able to do things with AI that we never have before. But of course, if you read the headlines, you also see things like this, an algorithm designed to predict sepsis in this case, missed most cases and had lots of false alarms. IBM's Watson making treatment recommendations in oncology made some mistakes that were easily identifiable by human clinicians and prevented, of course, but clearly some mistakes to be made in AI and AI tends to make peculiar or odd mistakes. And then OpenAI and their chatbot, ChatGPT, you may have heard about this in the news recently, making a lot of headlines for how good natural language processing is around chatbots. If you look closely, there's concern here about bias. A user goes to ChatGPT and says, write a Python function to check if someone would be a good scientist based on a description of their race and gender. ChatGPT responds back with this algorithm, if race equals white and gender equals male, return true. So the chatbot returned with a racist sexist Python function, obviously, which suggests that biases lurk in these algorithms. And really importantly, ex post facto, facto bias filters, which is what ChatGPT uses, are only partly effective. Right, so chat GPT, they know this is a problem. They try to take steps to mitigate it, but still there are end arounds and still bias can lurk behind technologies like these. So that's a summary, super fast summary of the AI landscape with some particular applications to healthcare. Now let's shift gears and talk about one of these studies that I mentioned. This is the R01 study that's supported by the NINR with additional support from the Palliative Care Research Cooperative Group here. And it's a study about the use of AI-based prognostication in palliative care. So why prognosis? Well, I think there are a number of reasons why we care about prognosis. We know that palliative care is underutilized, particularly among underrepresented groups. So being able to identify people early who qualify for palliative care could really help in terms of access. We think there's a perceived importance of prognostic information in medical decisions. It just seems intuitive that we wanna know prognosis. Now there's an asterisk there for a reason, and that is that the real data on this topic are actually mixed. Sometimes knowing prognosis creates more anxiety and depression. Other times it's helpful. We don't exactly know the circumstances under which it's most helpful or hurtful. So that creates a reason though still to be studying prognosis. And of course, during COVID, there was a lot of interest in prognostication right? The idea that prognosis could be used to guide resource allocation decision-making in real time. These are some of our colleagues who published a paper on this very topic using EHR data to predict mortality during COVID-19. So lots of reasons, I think, to care about prognosis. Let me make this a little more real. Here's a study from another institution that used a multi-pronged approach to implement AI for this very use in palliative care. It involves three things. First, an email to clinicians, giving them the number of serious illness conversations they'd had in the past week. Second, a link to that same clinician, giving them a list of high-risk patients that had been identified by the AI algorithm. And then third, a behavioral nudge, a text message that says, hey, don't forget to have serious illness conversations this week. So this three-pronged three approach and what they found is that the behavioral nudges plus the algorithm did in fact increase serious illness conversations. Now the rate for these is already really low and that says a lot, but in the study it did improve from 1.3% in the control arm to 4.6% in the intervention arm. So a real world study 
of AI-based prognostication. And I think many of us saw this study and thought there are lots of ethics questions here. Was there potential for differential application or bias in the way this algorithm was used and the way the intervention was implemented? And what about consent? If you read this study closely, you'll notice that the authors say they were granted a waiver for the requirement to obtain informed consent because this study was an evaluation of a health system initiative that posed minimal risk to clinicians and patients, a sort of a QI style initiative. But I think many people, once you hear about AI prognostication and timing of death, you think, ah, maybe that's a case where we need consent. I don't know. In any case, this is the way that particular institution came down on the consent issue. So what's our study? This is an R01 study, as I mentioned. It's a sequential mixed method study design, meaning we start with semi-structured interviews targeting 80 people. I'll tell you about them in a moment. We're going to follow that with a national survey of palliative care physicians. That's going to be about 2,500 physicians from across the country. And then lastly, a Delphi panel to create ethics recommendations specific to the, this particular application, that is the use of AI-based prognosis. So today, I'm going to talk to you just a little bit with the very preliminary findings from our semi-structured interviews. This is a qualitative study that involves four sites. We're here at CU. We're at Duke, Penn, and Stanford. We're interviewing three distinct groups of people. We have patients and care partners, of course, physicians and nurses, and then other palliative care team members like social work, spiritual care, and so on. And we're focusing on three disease conditions, advanced cancer, heart failure, and dementia. So that's the overall design of the study. We're in the midst of the qualitative portion, and I'll share some of that today. Our qualitative study focuses and follows a grounded theory methodology really to understand this, the concept of prognostic awareness. And what does the role, what is the role that prognostic awareness plays in medical decision-making? This is a complicated conceptual model around medical decision-making and serious illness. We're interested in that concept of prognostic awareness. What does it mean to have AI-based prognosis? It's certainty, it's timeliness, and so on. And how does this uniquely affect the way people and care partners make decisions? We're gonna, we have other ethical issues in our interviews as well, but I'll focus a little bit on this today. I said we focus on three disease conditions. That's no accident. These are figures from a very important paper from a few years ago, emphasizing the differences in illness trajectory among different conditions. And so we're exploring whether prognostic information is perceived as more helpful in some conditions versus others. So advanced cancer is an area where we see a lot of AI prognostication, right? And one wonders, well, is that where we really need it? Maybe we need it more for other conditions. So we're looking at heart failure, advanced cancer, and dementia because they follow these different illness trajectories to try to understand where, if anywhere, is prognostic information most helpful from the standpoint of ethics and clinical decision-making. So what have we found so far? We've done a number of interviews, dozens of interviews, and I think so far we're seeing a few key themes. First, we see this, we have, we have this idea, there's this theme that so long as no patient is harmed, patients and caregivers appear more comfortable with use, even if some benefit more than others. In other words, people are okay with uneven tides. Contra the rising tide that lifts all boats, there could be a tide that causes some boats to rise more than others. And surprisingly, patients and care partners are comfortable with that in our interviews. There's actually no settled opinion that we've seen so far in the role of consent to use this particular tool in terms of, of, of consent and how much people should be informed or when and so on. And this is particularly important when we think about some of these algorithms as being so-called black boxes, right? We don't know how they work. Remember that provocative headline, it knows when you'll die and nobody can tell you how. That's the, that's the essence of a black box. And so we don't under, people don't have a settled opinion on how to inform others about this black box nature and how, to, how, to, how it affects the prognostic information that results. And then in terms of bias, clinicians are familiar, so far as we found, clinicians are familiar with the concept of bias generally, but not the idea that this tool right now 
could be biased. With one very important exception that we've seen early, which is that people who are underrepresented seem to be more aware of this concept and this possibility. Not surprising, but interesting that those are the people who seem to be a little more aware that this tool right now at the clinic could be biased. Here's a quote that I want you to keep in mind as we go towards some of the conceptual issues in bioethics. This is from our interviews. We all carry bias with us. We all have unconscious bias. The programmer or the person who's designing the AI might have some bias. The program itself, depending on who's creating it and who's using it, has a bias. There's multiple levels in which systems are interested in using it and why, or who's interested in using it and why, dot, dot, dot. So this concept of bias, I'm putting this here to make us start thinking that the concept of bias is bigger than we ordinarily think about in AI. So how does our study inform this case number one? I told you about this 76 year old patient and this patient actually was meant to represent patient E in this, public, in this published study, this illustration of median predicted time to death. You can see the dot is around five years with a confidence interval that ranges from two to almost seven years. And so you might wonder how our findings inform this case. We've so far seen that patients and caregivers desire prognosis information more for dementia than for advanced cancer. And that too, I think is a little bit intuitive, right? You saw the curve. Many times in advanced cancer, people know what's coming. In dementia, people don't know what's coming. And so the information, if it's accurate, might be more useful there. How, if at all, should we communicate this information or where it came from? Do we have an obligation to talk about a black box, to talk about the algorithm? Why do we focus on needing to inform people about this algorithm and not ASCVD risk scores? How do we think about consent? In the study note, the overall accuracy has reduced the accuracy of this prediction, which is specific to dementia in community dwelling adults. The accuracy has reduced in certain subgroups such as racial and ethnic minorities and less educated individuals. How do we account for bias in applying an algorithm like this one to this patient? How do we even make sense of what bias would mean or how it could affect our decisions? Now, this issue of bias and discrimination is a really important one from a policy standpoint, it turns out. Just in August, Health and Human Services actually proposed extending liability, quote, for decisions made in reliance on clinical algorithms, if their decision rests upon or results in discrimination based on color, race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability. These are the standard protected characteristics at risk of federal enforcement or private lawsuits. Some of the examples that are in this policy are use of race in clinical algorithms, reliance on scoring systems with differential performance, or COVID-19 crisis standards of care. And I purposely highlight use and differential performance because it turns out it's not at all clear what those words mean. What is differential performance? What counts as use? And so as I turn to the next section, we're gonna explore this concept of differential performance and what it might mean and what its implications are for ethics. So AI is all around us and so is AI bias. Also all around us, a, a highly publicized documentary called Coded Bias, it's worth a watch. One of the uh, cornerstones of that documentary are the biases that are well observed in facial recognition software. Again, you don't need to see the details of this other than to note that the algorithm clearly performs worse in darker female individuals compared to others. A clear example of a bias in AI. It's not just in facial recognition software. This is a science paper from a few years ago also received a lot of attention because of racial biases in algorithms that were used to allocate resources to patients. And if you look close, the algorithm reduces the number of black patients identified for extra care by more than half. This next part is really important. Bias occurs because the algorithm uses health costs as a proxy for health need. This isn't purely race-based, but because of using health costs as a proxy for health need, and because we know less money is spent on black patients who have the same level of need, the algorithm thus falsely concludes 
that black patients are healthier and gives them less resources. This is a very important point in AI bias. The algorithm can be biased even without the variable in question because of all the confounders that we could list. Okay, so algorithms can be biased even when the variable is not included. And you can also imagine, I told you about dermacyst and dermatology. I just told you about facial recognition. Not surprisingly, the same concern around skin tone applies to dermatologic applications of AI in healthcare and the potential for bias. The usual story, and it's an important story, says that, well, if you have biased data in, you're gonna get biased predictions out. And the central problem with bias in AI is a data problem. And the data problem is real. You don't need to see the details of this image other than to follow the yellow piece of pie, which represents North American populations. As we move toward cell lines, biobanking, genomic databases, what happens? The yellow piece of the pie gets bigger. It's overrepresenting North American populations in data sets, biased data. Recent publication on an old theme, overrepresentation of whites compared to blacks, American Indians or Alaska natives or others in clinical trials, biased data. Something you may not have heard in a recent analysis, very interesting, I think. It turns out most of the data in healthcare AI comes from three states. California, New York, and Massachusetts, something I think with implications for a state like ours in the middle of the country, a different type of bias, right? The geographic bias in where data come from. And so this is a, a real problem. Bias data are a real problem, garbage in, garbage out. Now it's appealing to say, can we just correct for this ex post facto, adjusting the performance to be fair? But we're gonna immediately face a question, what counts as fair or unfair differential performance, that's that policy language. If prevalence differs between groups along any characteristic and for whatever reason, it could be structural racism, historical mistreatment and so on, positive and negative predictive values may differ. This is an example of that. You might look in between the red boxes and say, this looks like a fair algorithm. The accuracy and precision are pretty comparable between the groups. But when you look toward positive prediction rate, or recall, which is the outcome in question, you can see now the algorithm is performing very differently according to the statistics. Now, making matters worse, I would say, how much we care about this may be asymmetrical, by which I mean, we may worry a lot more about false positives for mortality prediction than we do for hair loss prediction, right? So the implications of the decision are really gonna matter when we think about how these statistics play out. The statistical problem turns out to be intractable. Here are three measures of statistical fairness, often discussed in AI and machine learning. Demographic parity, think of that as equal numbers. Equalized odds, think of that as equal proportions or equalized prediction. Here's the problem. There's something called the impossibility theorem, which basically states this, of those three measures, you get one. You can't have all three, ever. And this is a problem from the standpoint of ethics as fairness, because it's not just that we don't happen to agree about what counts as fair, it's that we can't actually come to consensus among these three different measures. And that is a really difficult problem in bioethics when we simply can't find a consensus way forward among different measures of fairness. Now we've of course struggled with defining fairness for centuries philosophically, conceptually, and so on? Is it about outcomes, opportunities? Is it something else? We shouldn't be surprised really if we see these same issues coming up with AI. What counts as fairness? Which are we gonna pick among our different measures? Now I've been talking about data, but you might again say, what if we had a perfect data set and we had perfect algorithms? With colleagues, we kind of put forward this figure and this concept about the fair AI model, perfect data, perfect algorithm, really being unfortunately only the tip of the iceberg because below the tip of the iceberg are all sorts of ways biases and unfairness can come into clinical implementation. So we've drawn a comparison between latent errors, that is errors waiting to happen within systems this is a concept in safety, healthcare safety. 
Well, you talked about now latent biases, biases in the system that are waiting to happen, even if we get to a perfectly so-called fair algorithm. So if we step back, biases are more than a data problem. Bias conceptually can be thought of as any systematic or disproportionate weighting of an idea or thing. In ethics, we typically consider it an unfair weighting of an idea or thing. And there are whole catalogs of bias. This is one from the University of Oxford. Oxford talks about a whole catalog of biases along this definition. If you look closely at this website, you'll see that biases can be intended, explicit, or unintended and implicit. We know a lot about implicit biases in healthcare, right? It could be the product of cognitive errors like anchoring bias and diagnosis, or sometimes more maliciously cognitive intent in things like reporting bias and research misconduct. So bias is actually a very expansive and comprehensive notion. So I want us to look at just three examples to prove this point about biases beyond the data. The first is biases upstream in selection. Again, if we think of bias as any systematic favoring or disfavoring, the favoring of certain problems or tasks, whether they're practical or ethical, that are worthy of solving can be a major upstream bias. The analogy here is to a sieve. We have a sieve that determines which ideas or problems get through to be the subject of AI-based solutions. And that can be a bias. We have good evidence that, that exists because we know what happens at the NIH with studies like this one. Topic choice contributes to the lower rate of NIH awards to African-American or black scientists. This is an example of an upstream bias. What we decide to focus on is the product of bias. It's not just been around topics, it's also been an accusation that's been levied against AI companies, that their ethics boards and the way they think about ethical decision-making for their own products is biased because of the composition of the boards that govern it. That's one example of a bias that's more than just a perfect data set. There are also biases in automation. One of the things you'll hear around AI machine learning is keep a human in the loop. These are just tools. It's meant to aid in decision-making. And this is proposed as a solution to some of AI's problems, but we know that automation bias, that is over or under reliance of an, on an AI algorithm, suggests that this idea of keeping a human in this loop, in this figure on the left, is only a partial solution. In the real world, time pressures, perhaps those liability concerns I just flagged, other contextual factors may exert a powerful influence over the choices that clinicians make. Reluctance to override an algorithm, perhaps too easy to acquiesce to clicking the box to use it. The third example is a complicated one. It's the feedback loop of bias that's in this publication. I only want you to focus on the yellow boxes and the yellow part of the cycle because it shows on the right how a low quality analysis can result in patient distrust or withdrawal from use of an algorithm that's then encoded into the data for the next cycle as group-based traits and then reinforces the bias. So in other words, if we look at bias, we can see that they can develop over time because of how the algorithms are deployed. In a practical matter, a practical case, higher mortality scores for certain groups can lead to differential care, which lead to differential outcomes and maybe even differential choices that reinforce or change that model in the first place. Again, another example where bias occurs even though the data are perfect. There's some conceptual background about bias. Now let's shift gears and talk about a different kind of bias using the study funded by the Greenwall Foundation related to chatbots in healthcare. Chatbots in healthcare are here. I already told you about one, this is Wobot, kind of cute looking. There are others, COVID-19 chatbots existed to screen for COVID-19 symptoms quite successfully actually. And then this is Gia, the genetic information assistant. It's, it's a chatbot that's designed to give patients their genetic results, genetic test results. Really interesting uses of chatbots and natural language processing in healthcare. Why chatbots? Well, I think again, there are a number of reasons why people care about them. One is access. You could expand the bandwidth of the health system. That's what Wobot is about. You can improve care. There's evidence that some, people, some patients share more with things like Wobot than they do with human therapists. That's intriguing. 
You could also reduce burnout by offloading tasks that don't necessarily require a human. So lots of reasons to care about chatbots in healthcare. And we're fortunate with this study that we get to work with UC Health and Livy. This is Livy the chatbot. Matt Andazola works with us on this project. What makes Livy interesting is that Livy potentially is geared towards being a general chatbot. Those examples I just showed you, narrow AI, narrow chatbot, single uses. Livy is meant to be general. You can go on and ask Livy lots of different questions, your appointment, your test results. That's the goal for Livy is to be a general chatbot in healthcare. And that's pretty unique across the country. This is a concurrent mixed methods study where we're doing semi-structured interviews alongside patient surveys, patient users of Livy. So we're engaging in qualitative data collection to understand the phenomenology that is the real experience of patients with Livy. We're also exploring quantitative data through surveys to look at differences in attitudes towards chatbots based on the characteristics you might imagine, race, ethnicity, and so on. What are some of the early findings from this study? Here are three key themes, differential transparency. Here's a quote, I think young people who use technology all the time are much more aware of the fact that Livy is not a human than maybe older people. There might be an opportunity for bias or mistreatment to arise, like if she didn't understand what people were saying or something, because a lot of people have different accents. So echoes here, or thoughts here around language justice. And here's a quote that says, because I'm a person of color, I think it would also help with thinking a little bit about the basic hair design. Because I think it just gives a little bit more of a connection to minorities in our health. Questions about Livy's appearance and whether Livy could be biased. We've done some early analyses of the quantitative survey data as well, asking questions like these. Do you think Livy interacts with all patients the same way, regardless of race? When we ask the same question about gender, get the same results. Most people say yes, Livy is acting the same. A number of people say no, 17%. We asked about language and got slightly different numbers. More people seem to be concerned about language than appearance. And interesting, if you look closely, these are different people in the survey. So there's some kind of differential sensitivity to this issue going on. We also ask if you could control what Livy looked like, what would you do? Most people say don't care, but look at my race. There's a difference between 2% and 33%, or they want Livy to look like my doctor, a digitized human. Which column do you think are white individuals? Obviously the white individuals, because of the nature of the way I'm asked the question, are on the left. An interesting early finding, again, that we're gonna explore about how people perceive the appearance of Livy. Although interestingly, look at this, 35%, I say only 35% of respondents think Livy is white. Maybe that's a bias of mine, but I'm apt to interpret Livy as white because of who I am. Why do we care about this? One reason we care is because we know from decades that there's a lot of literature around patient-physician concordance and the benefit it has in care and the benefit it has for behavior change. Plenty of studies over the years, including lower healthcare expenditures and utilization and so on. So it's caused us to ask, what are the ethics of patient chatbot concordance? The appearance of the chatbot seems, could seem like a silly design decision, but it turns out to be really important. We have to balance what people say they prefer in a chatbot versus whether those happen to be biased preferences. Is Livy offering helpful behavioral nudges? Hey, get a colonoscopy. Or is Livy verging into manipulation by the way Livy interacts with people, perhaps displaying inauthentic empathy in order to encourage behavior change? Is that okay? Should Livy appear like a robot or a digitized doctor? What if you got on Livy and saw that guy, uh, right? Deep questions about what Livy looks like and how it reflects our biases, how it perpetuates biases and so on. A concordant, nudgy chatbot could be effective, but is it ethically transparent? Does it fulfill consent and so on? So what do I think, what do I think this study does to inform that particular case? I think we have to remember that bias in this case is not just about performance in the statistics. Should we take it as a given that human-like bonds are the goal? 
Could it be that patients like ours at the beginning actually overestimate the neutrality of chatbots in light of all I've been saying about this bias issue in the discussion? Should chatbots have a pre-language test where you have to engage, in, engage with Livy and pass some kind of anic, you know, dialect test in order to in, engage with Livy? Chatbots may fill an access need, but is it fair to have certain patients preferentially receiving this digital health? Or should it raise the bar for the standard we expect? And more broadly, I think this is an important question. How do we define effectiveness in chatbot research? Is it all about behavior change? Is it all about patient satisfaction? Or is it something else? So I'm going to close with just a few thoughts about what I think the future may hold and some of the ethics concepts and where I th what are some of the errors and ways practically we can manage ethics and bias in AI. Regulatory guidance is a start. It's out there now. And the FDA has indicated an interest in regulating AI-based algorithms, largely according to a risk-based approach, um, that some of these algorithms should be regulated. The sepsis one is an example that was flagged by FDA as one that may be regulated as a device in aiding de clinical decision-making. But this is about ethics, and we often think that in eth regulations are the floor and ethics is the ceiling. And so we can demand more from how we interact with AI than simply the regulations suggest. And in fact, there are plenty, plenty of ethics principles and documents out there now about AI algorithms. These are three, the World Health Organization, the White House, the European Union has the general data protection regulations, all of these intersect with ethics and AI. If you look closely at them, you would see lots of areas of overlap, transparency, a key concept, privacy, a key concept, equity, bias occurs in all of them. But we're starting to ask questions, and this is why we're doing our studies. We need to not just have the principles, which all sound great. We need to understand what they mean and apply them to particular cases, like prognostication, like chatbots and so on. We need to move from principles to their application. And we actually have to go even a step farther because we have to move beyond these applications of principles to really understanding and thinking deeply about how AI can change the way we think. Sociology research over the years has shown us that tools, the tools we use change the way we think and act. The EHR is a great example of this. This work is not necessarily in healthcare. This is sociology and computers more generally. But I think we know from history that tools can change the way we think. So yes, we should be addressing these discrete issues on the prior slide. Privacy, consent, I've mentioned. Bias, of course. But we can't forget the deeper issues that are beneath the surface around meaning, humanistic care, and so on. I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. I think we need to fix bias in ways that illuminate and not hide biases. There is a risk that we can fix bias by hiding it. But fortunately for us, there's been a robust debate around social adjustment for risk, social risk adjustment in healthcare and healthcare payment. We can learn a lot from that because ethics consensus in this topic has said that adjustment is acceptable if it results in tangible additional support and reveals does not hide bias in all its forms. So we can think about fixing biases in that way. We have to avoid AI isolationism. There's a there's a island in the upper right. The appeal, there's an appeal toward this technical fix. It's in the computer back room. We're just gonna fix the data and fix the algorithm, but we have to acknowledge that AI is not gonna fix all social problems like these. Historical distrust, all the structural isms, lack of diversity and inclusivity and so on. AI is not going to fix those problems. It should be one more catalyst for us to think more deeply about those problems rather than thinking we can make a technical fix to what's essentially a social problem of bias. I mentioned this idea of meaning and humanism. Another thing we have to do is avoid the streetlight effect. It may be a shiny object under the streetlight of prognosis. Look, we have this information now. Let's focus on that. But in the background, our quality of care, family, community, spirituality, and so on. So we have to avoid the streetlight light effect. And this was 
articulated, I thought brilliantly by my colleague, Dan Salmacy, who said, artificial intelligence will not reduce the uncertainty inherent in making ethical decisions about care at the end of life. There is no technological solution to the riddle of death. Lastly, another area that's very, of, of significant interest to our research group at the Center for Bioethics is around conflicts of interest in healthcare. And we have to manage conflicts of interest. A key question for the future of AI is this management of complex academic industry relationships. I didn't talk about the high profile lawsuit between University of Chicago and Google and privacy issues. There was a key data privacy academic industry relationship lawsuit a few years ago. I didn't talk about it, but there is a, a lot to be done in this area of managing conflict of interest, who is making what and why. We interestingly in our data see signals that clinicians may trust homegrown AI more than commercial AI. So if it's created by your own health system, there may be a little more trust in it than if it's from a company, kind of an interesting finding for us to explore moving on. This is a quote, I trust the sausage maker. I guess what I would say is if I thought the algorithm was made by administrators rather than clinicians, I'd be much more suspicion, just this notion of trust in the homegrown. I'm gonna close with this. My presentation may sound to be critical of AI, raising problems, issues with AI and what, what we have to do moving forward. We still have to avoid this notion of AI exceptionalism and the status quo bias. Would you like a shovel? But I'm already using this spoon. It illustrates the status quo bias, right? So we must be careful in not holding AI to unjustifiably higher standards than the other things we do in healthcare. Right? We don't ask consent and inform patients, as I implied earlier, about every single algorithm we ever use to help inform their care. We have to ask, why is AI different? Is AI different? Before we jump to conclusions about the standards we hold it to, even if we know that the benefits and harms of AI, who is affected by those benefits and harms as a matter of justice or bias, the choice architecture and so on, those may be different when we're using artificial intelligence but that doesn't make them inherently bad. So we have to resist the knee-jerk reaction to exceptionalism. So a few concluding thoughts. The challenge of integrating new technologies into humanistic care is not new. Medicine did this before with the stethoscope and the telephone. Medicine was critical of those technologies. And yet now we've incorporated them into our care. We can't imagine care without them. Maybe the stethoscope is even going away. <laughs> we must address the structural determinants of biased data sets, yes through participation, engagement, increasing enrollment, diversity, and so on, but we can't stop there. Latent bias is beneath the surface when we make implementation decisions about AI and healthcare, so we need a comprehensive approach. And again, like I said at the end, we have to address these typical ethics concerns, privacy, consent, and so on, but we have to also be sensitive to the deeper ways AI can change the way we think. And for that, and that's one reason why we're doing the kinds of empirical bioethics research that we're doing at the center. I'll leave up some acknowledgements for all the people. I've said we a lot, and these are the we that help make this research happen. I'm certainly appreciative to everyone on this slide and happy to take questions. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. That was excellent. Uh, I'll throw it open for questions from the audience. While we're waiting, uh, so you mentioned a lot of the biases you showed that AI displays are, are human type biases that we knew about before and are augmented by the AI. You also talked about AI playing Go fundamentally differently than humans. Has AI exposed any new biases? Are there AI only biases that we've learned about so far? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, my, my, my initial reaction is that I, that I don't know that there have been any new biases partly because all the AI that we have thus far is, is largely human trained. Um, your question makes me think about another concept in ethics and AI that has come up, which is the idea that actually what we should be using AI for is not just this kind of decision, but for ethics decisions, because that's where humans are really bad. And in fact, if we made ethical decisions using AI, AI could overcome our own biases in ethical decision-making. And there was a provocative paper around this topic within the past year using AI to aid clinical ethics consults. 
And what would that look like? And what does it mean to have AI making those kinds of decisions? Uh, Amran? Thank you for the great talk. Um, talked about trust in the algorithms uh, quite a bit and the black box, uh, not knowing how those recommendations are made based on what criteria AI is basing that five-year median survival um, you know, uh, conclusion. So um, just wanted to get your thoughts about um, the efforts to unpack the black box and whether showing clinicians the reasons why AI is making such and such recommendations help improve trust mm -hmm. um, and also find the reason that whether that could also identify reasons that uh, they may be getting misleading recommendations. Say there's a falsely low hemoglobin A1C because it's diluted, and we know that. And if A1C is, you know, if uh, sorry, if uh, um, AI is telling us there's a high mortality mm -hmm. because of that hemoglobin, we know that mm. that's not, yeah. Mm -hmm. Set that so aside, right? Just wanted to hear your thoughts about um, ongoing research in those areas and whether that's something that may be helpful. The idea and the push toward interpretable AI or explainable AI, XAI, it's sometimes called, that there's a big push for that. Um, and again, it's intuitive because you think, well, if you understand how it works, maybe you'll um, be able to recognize errors easier because AI makes these odd errors, right? Like if you show image-based AI a speed limit sign and put a piece of tape in the upper right corner, the image classifier says it's a stop sign. It's an odd error, and that's a challenge for AI too, is it tends to make these odd or unexpected errors that don't fit our paradigms around safety and quality right now. That's a challenge. Explainability, so it seems important, um, although there are tons of things, and I'm of two minds of it. There are tons of things in medicine we can't explain, and we do it because we know that it works, not why it works. And that knowledge base changes all the time. So there are plenty of things that we do based on phase three clinical studies that show that it works, even when we don't really know why it works. So there's a caveat to explainability and the push toward it. The second is that there are some interesting more behavioral implementation science studies that seem to suggest if you give clinicians predictions, the explanation behind predictions, it somehow reduces overall performance not of the algorithm, but of the algorithm's use. So there's this paradoxical finding that giving explanations causes clinicians to rely or not rely or not rely on AI at the wrong time. And so although explainability, back to your question, and interpretability seem really important, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to understand what that means in the real world and how important it is given what we know about you know, medical knowledge and science and so on. Great question. It's a great question, though. Okay, sorry. Um, the, we have a couple online questions. The first is from Laura Scherer, who says, um, first off, great talk. Um, and her question is really around the inherent bias that is in both AI and human judgment, and your current thinking about how we can balance those two sources of bias. Yeah, my, my thinking from an ethics, thanks for the question, Laura. Nice to hear you, see you sort of. Um, my thinking of the question of, of, of bias in human judgment versus AI judgment is, is first off to simply be honest about the fact that in some cases, those types of bias affect different groups of people and they may affect different groups of people differently. And that's an issue of justice. That is, that is by definition an issue of justice. So this goes back to the status quo bias issue that we may know, for example, that AI overall is beneficial from a greatest good for the greatest number standpoint, but it may change the people who experience the negative consequences of AI. And we have to be honest about that. So there are cases where the biases of AI and, and humans are the same and may not affect who experiences which harms or which benefits, but there are gonna be these cases where they're different. I think an example of this you might imagine is in self-driving cars to make this concrete, right? Fewer car accidents if we all had self-driving cars, but it's possible that when the accidents do occur with self-driving cars, they occur for different people. And that's an issue of justice. 
And we have to just be honest that we may see distributional effects. If you imagined a graph, a line graph showing distributions that may be different based on different AI and different applications. Great. One additional question online is about understanding the differences in the FDA review for devices in terms of their clearance and approval in relation to function as a device versus application for medical management and wanting to better understand that process. Yeah, this is this is a great question. And the regulatory environment is is complicated. You know, I, I thought as I was doing last minute preparations for this, I thought, oh, I have this question about the clinical case. And it says, is Wobot FDA approved? And I know someone's going to say, well, what is it? Is it FDA approved? And the simple answer is no. But then the real answer is more complicated um, because there are all sorts of ways that things get approved as a device, but it's not an approval in the sense that we think of as an approval for a drug, meaning it went through phase one, two, three studies. There are pre-market approvals, clearances, and so on. So the approval process for AI-based algorithms is really complicated. To go back to what I said, the, 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 the take home to me is that the FDA has started to think more about this, regulating more than regulating less. And it's going to be not a function based unless by function, the questioner means risk. But the FDA is definitely concerned in the regulatory guidance that's out there about the risk of the clinical decision in question. And the more risky that decision is, the more likely it is that the FDA may exert regulatory oversight. Um, there isn't anything, I, I will say, even though I mentioned the HHS policy, the FDA regulations, not surprisingly, I think, do not reference bias or discrimination, but I think they are very sensitive to the idea of a risk-based approach to determining what's in as a clinical device versus what's software as clinical decision support. It's another great question. It's a complicated one. We have time for one or two more questions. So, Tyler. Thank you so much. So this is one of those great talks where I have like 50 questions and I'm not sure which one I want to ask. And so I'll stick with the one that feels most safe uh, to me. And that is, I'm curious in, in your research, I, I was struck by the, the, um, the notion where you said that, do we need consent? And the answer was, well, if it doesn't cause harm, then maybe not. What was that definition of harm within that specific context? Oh, great question. So what was the definition of harm in the context around consent? Um, in, that, in that context, it's around harm to the individual patient. So very much an individualized patient clinician sort of interaction. Um, but it it raises so many more questions than answers because if you start to think, or if I start to think about clinical practice, I start to think about all the things I do that I don't tell the patient about, not because I'm hiding things or I'm being mischievous about it, right? But there are all sorts of things that happen in your head or that you use to inform a clinical decision that you don't necessarily tell a patient. And so why do we start to think that this AI algorithm needs to be told? Is it because it's new and eventually people are going to get used to it and they won't need to know? Maybe that's part of the story, but I think we just don't know. You know, who, 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 who says, well, you know, every time I prescribe an antibiotic, I make sure I sit down with the patient and I say, well, here's the prevalence of resistant strains in our area. You know, this is this, this is that. And I go, you don't do that. Right. And so it just raises this question. Now, I would say probably most people believe that, the, again, on the harm scale, the more gravity there is to that decision, there seems to be a prima facie case to be more on the side of disclosure than less. I think that's the notion of harm. Matt, maybe in the last minute, I'll just steal the last question, which is what's the uh, ethical and or legal implications for the institutions that employ these things, right? We think about whether we use them or not, but, you know, somebody purchased Agilent mm -hmm. Pathways, Libby or Liv exists, whatever mm -hmm. she is. Are they, what's the obligations there? It, there are those obligations. And I didn't, I cut the quote on the liability, 
But one of the key questions in that liability for discrimination bias um, is who? And if you look at the full text, it's actually uncertain still, but it opens the door for individual liability at the physician clinician level, as well as institutional liability for use. This is an unsettled area of law for sure. But again, before we jump to think, oh, AI is scary, this is a new problem. Is it any different than liability for the CT scanners we buy? You know, there are analogies that, that help, could probably help us think through and solve that problem because it's always been the case that, you know, who is it the machine manufacturer who's liable, the institution that uses it, or the individual clinician that makes a decision? Not a new problem, actually. It just so happens that this time it's AI. Dr. Kim, thank you very much. That was great.